phenomenon of the replacement of uh, local municipal governments with these uh, groups that are loyal to Moscow. And in addition to this, and this is something that I'd like to highlight, uh, we believe that the Kremlin may try to hold sham referenda to try to add a veneer of democratic or electoral legitimacy. Uh, and this is straight out of the Kremlin's playbook. They organize these sham referenda, uh, as you all know, in, in Crimea, in Luhansk, in Donetsk, and in other places. Uh, and what it calls, what the, the Kremlin playbook calls for is uh, delegitimizing, as I said, the democratically elected leaders and imposing fake people's councils, essentially made up of uh, the Kremlin's uh, puppets and, and proxies. Again, this is something that we've seen in the past, uh, and we're looking uh, very closely to see whether the Kremlin might try to orchestrate something like this uh, in the near future. Um, so just as Russia engineered these quasi-statelets, the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic, now we believe uh, that uh, the Kremlin may be trying to organize a Kherson People's Republic in the Kherson Oblast of southern Ukraine. And here's something that I also would like to highlight. According to the most recent reports, we believe that Russia will try to annex the Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic, in quotes, so-called, to Russia. Uh, the reports state that Russia has plans to engineer referenda on joining Russia uh, sometime in mid-May, and that Moscow is considering a similar plan for Kherson. Now, the international community, including the OSCE, where I work as ambassador, has been very clear that such referenda, such sham referenda, fabricated votes, uh, will not be considered uh, legitimate, nor will any attempts to annex additional Ukrainian territory. Um, but we have to act. We have to act with a sense of urgency. Uh, and if you'll allow me, I will say a few things that we're doing at the OSCE in this regard. We are exposing Russia's actions. We're doing it here in Washington from the podium every day. My colleagues are. We're doing it at the OSCE. We're doing it in other multilateral fora. We are standing with Ukraine. We are isolating Russia diplomatically, which is the case at the OSCE. We are working to provide overtime uh, and leaving no stone unturned to try to get humanitarian assistance to the populations in need across Ukraine. Uh, and we're working, in fact, at the OSCE on the ground to provide some of that humanitarian relief, as well as calling for a humanitarian pause and an end to this monstrous war of choice that Russia has waged on Ukraine. So that's, uh, that's what I've got, uh, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Great. Start with a few questions. Yes. You mentioned Russia's political intentions. You also see pictures of how Russian troops are declaring victory and then um, installing the status of Lenin. Why are they doing this? Well, look, I'm not going to speak to the uh, political mythology that Russian forces are trying to impose on democratic Ukraine, but I think it speaks volumes that we have seen this sort of effort underway and uh, jibes certainly with the propaganda that we have heard from Moscow. Yes, sir. Um, can you detail um, you know, how specific are those reports and what, what, what is the source? Is this intelligence? And uh, do you have any response plan to, you know, to react to, to that? Any more sanctions? So we think the reports are highly credible for reasons I'm sure you all can appreciate. I won't get into specific sources and methods, but we have every reason to believe that these reports are highly credible. And I can't, by the way, I'll just uh, follow up on that. I cannot speak to whether Russia will be able to execute on its planning, but this is the planning that we uh, are seeing. Um, there's been some reports that Russia or President Putin might um, formally declare war uh, with Ukraine. I wonder if you uh, had any sense whether that's possible and, and what that might mean for some of these plans. You know, would that, would that give them any extra uh, ability to, uh, to conduct the, the kind of things you're talking about? Look, I know there's speculation that a, a de formal declaration of war would allow Russia to engage in mass mobilization, but I can't speak to their intentions. 
Sorry, yeah, sorry for being late and then forgetting my phone and having to leave. But <clears throat> um, on the re reports that you're talking about, about uh, Donetsk and Luhansk and uh, annexation, um, what, what, what can the OSCE actually do about this? Uh, you know, we've already seen uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia. We've already seen Crimea. Well, I think as the well, secretary, you know, you, yeah. you, know, you can you can come out and say, oh, well, we oppose this all you want to, but you know, the reality on the ground is that both those two places of part of Georgia, that you would argue, are you know essentially not part of Georgia, and uh, even though they're not recognized by anyone other than Nicaragua and Belarus, maybe, uh, what actually can you do? Well. Part of what we're trying to do is to expose Russia's intentions. And as the Secretary said some time ago, unfortunately, we have been more right than wrong mm -hmm. um, in exposing what we believe may be coming next. And so that is part of what we are trying to do here. Uh, but of course, this all falls into the larger strategy of uh, dealing with uh, Russia's revanchism and imposing costs uh, and degrading their war machine. Okay, but then, you know, look. look Crimea. I mean, this is stuff that you don't have to warn about. It's stuff that's already actually happened. And, uh, you know, and you and others can say, we don't recognize Crimea as part of Russia, and yet it is de facto, right? We do not recognize well, I know you don't, but <laughs> but, uh, but I would just remind you of the Wellis Declaration, which held for many, many decades as a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy. I, I get that, but, the but, but I'm just wondering, the OSCE seems to be completely toothless here. It can't really do anything. Well, the OSCE, you know, that's a separate question. Uh, the OSCE is a consensual organization, but it has engaged, first of all, it has a field presence in Ukraine. Project Coordinator's Office does exist inside Ukraine and assists with the disbursement of humanitarian relief. Uh, we have invoked something called the Moscow Mechanism, which is an accountability tool for documenting human rights uh, abuses, war crimes, and possible crimes against humanity. Uh, and we speak out and we isolate uh, Russia and Belarus diplomatically, as I said at the outset. So we're going to continue to do that. Look, the OSC is not the perfect forum. It doesn't allow us to accomplish every goal, but we use it to the extent that we can. Um, two questions, Ambassador Denise Lama from the Wall Street Journal. Um, on the question of war crimes, I'm wondering um, what the OS, uh, OSCE's role has been. In particular, you know, we're talking about um, the southeastern part of the country where we're hearing reports about mobile crematorium and other ways that Russia is trying to basically hide some of its tracks, allegedly hide some of its tracks um, uh, in terms of what's been going on there. And so what effort are you making to collect with, your, with our allies and partners um, any kind of evidence and investigate and possibly prosecute down the line in conjunction with the UN and um, the International Criminal Court um, and whether or not that's being complicated by efforts to hide, to cover it up. Yeah, that's a great question. So the OSCE in early March invoked something that I just referred to called the Moscow Mechanism, the US together with 44 other participating states. And as a result of that, we were able to deploy a fact-finding team that uh, collected evidence on uh, violations of human rights, on war crimes, and on possible crimes against humanity. That team then released a report a couple of weeks ago, which in fact stated unequivocally that war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. Now, I'm not uh, an international lawyer, but my understanding is that those crimes then uh, get prosecuted at the individual level. And so it is now incumbent on that fact-finding team and other similar accountability mechanisms to collect the evidence, preserve the evidence, and then eventually build cases so that everybody at all levels of the chain of command is held accountable. The other question I wanted to ask you is there's been um, a discussion about replacing Ukraine's weapons with sort of NATO-grade weapons, and I'm wondering if OSCE is also kind of working in conjunction with NATO to be able to um, kind of phase out some of the more Soviet-era weapons and security systems that Ukraine has to give them sort of a overall like uh, post-Soviet um, arsenal that they can fight this war? Yeah, this is not something that the OSCE is involved in. Uh, the OSCE does have a political military dimension, but it's primarily focused on military transparency and confidence in security building. Saeed and Michelle. Thank you, Ned. Thank you, Ambassador. Very quick question. We've heard the, the Secretary of Defense, and I believe the Secretary of State, talk about 
a week in Russia, a week in Russia. Uh, we, we heard the strategic uh, defeat uh, for Russia. What does that mean? What, what will that look like? Is that going so to I believe be the Secretary of Defense like referred to a strategic failure um, <laughs> as the goal and of degrading uh, Russia's war machine so that it cannot prosecute this monstrous of a campaign against its neighbors in the future. And that does remain very much a part of uh, one of our goals. But, okay, but I just want to follow up. Do you expect the, the Russian president on May 9, a week from today, uh, to make some sort of a, a announcement that goals have been achieved and victory was done, you know, much like, let's say, uh, President the, George W. Bush did back in 2003. I can't anticipate what President Putin is going to do on May 9th. I know that so far the military campaign has been an abject failure, and the monstrosity and the barbarity of Russia's uh, assault is plain for all to see. Yeah, um, you were saying that they still have monitors in Ukraine. Are they able to um, document some of these things you're talking about, the abductions, um, taking people out of Ukraine and forcing them into Russia? Do you have any sense of the scale of that? And then secondly, um, have you seen any indications that the Russians are stirring up trouble in any of the, these other frozen conflicts where the OSCE does have monitors, whether Transnistria or Nagorno-Karabakh or any of these other yeah. frozen conflicts? So on your first question, uh, the OSCE did have a several hundred person strong uh, special monitoring mission in Ukraine that was deployed primarily around the line of contact. Um, and that monitoring mission uh, did exist until a few weeks ago when it was evacuated, at first temporarily, but then Russia vetoed the mandate, uh, essentially, of the, of the SMM, or the monitoring mission. And so that mission is now in a wind-down process. Uh, as far as some of the other protracted conflicts on Russia's periphery, uh, of course, we watch very carefully. Uh, there were some unexplained explosions in Transnistria. Uh, just last week, and we continue to look very carefully, and it is in fact part of the OSC mandate to monitor uh, the security situation in and around Transnistria in Moldova. And of course, we watch Nagorno-Karabakh, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia as well. A few more questions. Yes. Violations in the occupied territories of Georgia and the role of OC uh, is, has always been so important for us. Again, in this background, Georgia has repeatedly heard calls about the opening of Second Front, as in that now might be the time for Georgia to retake the occupied territories by military force. How acceptable do you think uh, are such statements and calls? We think that the Georgian government has behaved very responsibly when it comes to uh, its own territories of Abkhazia and Skinvali region. Uh, and we have, of course, uh, been steadfast supporters of Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. Uh, at this moment, there is an EU monitoring mission on the ground in Georgia, as you're well aware. And the OSC also participates in something called incident response and prevention mechanisms. Uh, on the administrative boundary lines uh, of both Abkhazia and Skinvali region. Uh, and so we continue to monitor the situation. Okay. When will the United States Embassy resume the work in Kyiv? Is it soon as possible? Well, the Secretary has said that we intend to go back uh, into Ukraine. I think there's already temporary visits occurring right now, uh, but on a more permanent basis in the near future. I can't speak to the timing. Question. You've spoken of filtration camps in the past. Do you have an estimate of how many Ukrainians have been forcibly moved through these camps? And is there anything the OSCE is doing to try to track, you know, once they're taken out of Ukraine, what happens to these people? Yes. So uh, we have uh, exposed this uh, brutal practice, uh, or at least the reports of it. Uh, we have information from the Mariupol mayor's office that there are something like four of these filtration camps in and around Mariupol. Uh, I would expect there might be more uh, in the south and east of Ukraine. Uh, of course, this would be in violation uh, of international humanitarian law uh, in a war crime if people were forcibly being displaced from Ukraine to Russia. So the OSCE's human rights monitoring mechanism will continue to look at this. Of course, there's an issue of access, right? I mean, those, that's a war, an active war zone right now. And so access is limited, but we're going to continue to look at this, absolutely. Yes, please. This when you were asked about in one of your briefings a couple of weeks ago, but do you have anything more about those reports on children? Can you repeat? Um, I didn't hear the first part. Um, 
you spoke about this a couple of weeks ago in a briefing that you did. Do you have any more about reports about uh, enforced adoption of children, Ukrainian children, um, in the context of these filtration camps? Um, and also, you uh, you followed up a little bit on the president's uh, opinion that he believes that um, Putin is committing genocide in Ukraine. Uh, I know this is a long process uh, in terms of uh, a legal process, um, but you did comment a little bit on, um, on again, what you believed might uh, uh, a tribute to genocide. Can you comment at all on, on the length or the timing of this process? Well, so to the first part of your question, I would just say that if women and children and, and elderly and, and other individuals are being displaced forcibly, uh, as I said earlier, that would be a war crime and it would just be appalling uh, as a completely uncivilized uh, endeavor. Uh, and so, yes, it needs to be tracked very closely and documentation needs to be uh, done to ensure that there is accountability for such actions in the future. I can't speak to numbers, I can't speak to specifics because uh, the information is at this point quite limited. Uh, and then remind me the second part of your question. Um, on genocide, yes. So uh, I, I think I'll let my previous comments on this stand. I, I, I have nothing to add to that. Uh, final question, yes. Is there any indication PRC is helping the Russia on the ground in Ukraine? No, I don't think we have any indications at the current time that the PRC is uh, endeavoring to help uh, Russia with its military campaign in Ukraine, but uh, obviously we'll watch. Thank you, Ambassador. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank All right, so I don't have anything else at the top. Happy to take your questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Ned. Uh, welcome back from the weekend. Hope you had a good one. As well. um, two things really briefly on Ukraine, uh, and I've got two other subjects, but I'll let everyone else finish before, but just don't forget that I've got these two other non-Ukraine. We will come back to you. At the end. Um, <clears throat> first of all, <clears throat> on the question that was just asked about uh, the embassy uh, and diplomats going back in Ukraine, are they going in every day since... Have they been going in every day so, to Lviv? Sorry, uh, they, since 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 Tuesday, and is there a timeline that you can offer about the reopening of the embassy? For just about a week now, our uh, diplomats have been making day trips <clears throat> into Lviv from Poland, where they are currently based. It is not uh, every day, but it has been consistent. As some of you may have seen, they were in Lviv today. Uh, our charge uh, even did some uh, public appearances, uh, did some media appearances as well. Uh, but they have been able to take advantage uh, of these sporadic trips uh, into Lviv to meet with their counterparts from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, to meet with uh, civil society, uh, to meet with other uh, important stakeholders, uh, and they will continue to do that. Now, of course, we want to ladder up to having a regular presence in Kyiv. Uh, every single day we're monitoring the security situation on the ground to determine when we'll be able to do that. The only answer I can give you right now is the question of when is as soon as possible. Uh, I think it is fair to say, as you heard from uh, our charge today, that that will be within the coming weeks, uh, but it will depend on a regular assessment of the security situation and our ability to operate uh, safely and responsibly uh, from Keith. Right. And as you know, there's been quite a lot of uh, interest in the idea of Marine guards. Would they go to, would there be, uh, are, would there be, whether they are the fully dressed and uniformed uh, Marine guard detachment that uh, is at some, most, but not all embassies, uh, when, when that happens, the as soon as possible happens. Will, would, would, they would obviously be going in with security. So how does that uh, fit with the idea that uh, there aren't going to be any U.S. troops, soldiers on the ground in Ukraine? What I can tell you is that our diplomats will return to Kyiv just as soon as it is safe and responsible and appropriate for them to do so. There are obviously details that go into that question of safety and uh, responsible responsibility uh, in terms of any return to Kyiv. Uh, as you know, we don't comment on our uh, security practices. Uh, that will be the case here, but uh, our diplomats will be back on the ground in Kyiv just as, as it's safe the, for them to do so. The second one, and I'm just <clears throat> wondering if you, uh, you're you not directly involved in this, but I assure you have uh, seen uh, the comments that Foreign Minister Lavrov made um, in an interview with Italian uh, media about uh, anti-Semitism. I'm wondering if you have any comments on that. 
we of course have seen those despicable comments. Uh, we also saw a number of responses from other uh, world leaders. The one that stuck out to me, stuck out to many of us here, was the response from Israeli Foreign Minister Lapid. He is, of course, someone who speaks with a great deal of authority uh, on these matters. It would be impossible to improve upon uh, the response that he offered. Uh, as he said, the foreign minister's remarks are both an unforgivable and outrageous statement, as well as a terrible historical error. He went on to note that Jews did not murder themselves in the Holocaust. The lowest level of racism against Jews is to accuse Jews themselves of anti-Semitism. Uh, the statement from Foreign Minister Lavrov, it was the lowest form of racism. It was the lowest form of propaganda. It was the lowest form of insidious lies. And I think with it and other not only statements, but conduct from the Kremlin, its top officials, <clears throat> its personnel, including its personnel in Ukraine, uh, the Kremlin is consistently proving that there is no floor uh, when it comes to just how low they can stoop. And this, I think, is just the latest example of that. Yes, I follow up on uh, the answer I got regarding the strategic defeat. Now, unless I misunderstood what the ambassador said, but it, it dealt with degrading uh, I guess Russia's capability of making arms and so on like this, depleting their weapons, is that something akin to that? But you know, Russia is, makes its own weapons. I mean, they seem to have like a, an endless source of, of weapons and so on if they choose to. So coming back to your question and, and to the answer that the ambassador gave, uh, he accurately noted, uh, and uh, I think I've said this before, but I have been surprised, the level of surprise uh, that we've heard in response to Secretary Austin's comment. Uh, but as the ambassador noted, uh, what Secretary Austin was referring to uh, was a strategic failure on the part of uh, the Kremlin uh, and the Russians here. And we are two months in to the Kremlin's war effort in Ukraine. I think it is clear uh, to everyone, or it should be clear uh, to everyone who is looking at this impartially. Uh, the elements of the strategic failure that has already come to pass. Uh, Moscow had several objectives in mind when it went into Ukraine on February 24th. It sought to subjugate Ukraine, uh, to enhance Russian power, to divide the West. On each of those fronts, uh, you have seen Moscow uh, fail in its, uh, in its objectives. Uh, the Ukrainian people have demonstrated that Moscow will not be able to take Ukraine by force, that Ukraine's sovereignty, its independence, uh, will outlast uh, this military objective. Uh, you have seen that rather than enhance Russian power, uh, Russia's power in the region and beyond uh, is significantly diluted. And it is diluted because of something you referred to, Saeed. Uh, those are the export controls, but also the economic sanctions uh, that we have placed uh, on Moscow. It's diluted because of the diplomatic isolation, uh, the pariah status that President Putin's uh, war campaign in Ukraine has uh, bestowed upon him. Uh, to your specific question, uh, yes, Moscow uh, does have a defense industry. It is a defense industry that is not uh, wholly self-reliant. It is reliant on key inputs and products from the international community, including from the West. That is precisely what our export controls are designed to choke off. Uh, because of that, Moscow's uh, high tech, its defense sectors, its aerospace sector, its energy exploration sector, uh, a number of strategic sectors uh, that Moscow would need uh, for its uh, regional and, and uh, ambitions beyond the region uh, have been and are being starved. And as I said before, uh, Russia is now a pariah. It is a pariah in terms of uh, the response we've seen from the international community. You look at any number of uh, votes at the UN, for example, where 141 countries, the vast majority of the world country, world's countries have come together uh, to condemn President Putin's behavior. Uh, to what we are seeing from uh, countries 
uh, around the world, many of whom have uh, relationships uh, with, with Russia. Uh, and just today, I uh, made mention of uh, the response that we've heard from Foreign Minister Lapid uh, regarding uh, what Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, had to say. So this is a strategic failure uh, for Moscow. The ingredients of that uh, are already evident. Uh, every day we're seeing more evidence of it. And the strategy we have will be to continue uh, to empower our Ukrainian partners, uh, to empower them with security assistance, to support their economic needs, to support the humanitarian needs of the Ukrainian people, just as we continue to apply significant and really unprecedented amounts of pressure on Russia in terms of our sanctions, in terms of our export controls, in terms of uh, the diplomatic isolation that uh, we in turn are uh, applying with, again, dozens of countries uh, around the world. Jenny. On North Korea, Russia, and China regarding Russia, North Korean support Russia's war in Ukraine. If North Korea and China engage in military cooperation with Russia, the war is sure to escalate. What kind of efforts in, is the United States pursuing to prevent China and North Korea from cooperating with the Russia, and I follow up. Sure. Well, that is obviously uh, a hypothetical uh, at this point. Uh, you just asked, uh, one of your colleagues just asked Ambassador Carpenter about any uh, support that we are seeing the PRC provide to Russia's war effort. Uh, as we said a number of weeks ago, we had uh, indications that Russia was seeking that support. In response, we made very clear that we would watch closely uh, any reaction from the PRC. If, in fact, the PRC aided uh, Russia's war effort uh, in any way with weapons uh, helping it to offset uh, in a systemic way uh, the losses it is enduring from uh, the response of the international community, that there would be strong consequences from not only the United States, but from our allies and partners around the world. As the ambassador just made clear again, we have, in fact, been watching closely. We have not uh, detected any shift, but any shift would uh, incur those consequences. Uh, the second question, uh, recently uh, Russian President Putin and uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un uh, declared the use of uh, nuclear weapons. How do you analyze the impact of this on the Korean Peninsula? And does the United States recognize North Korea as a nuclear power state? Well, of course, we're concerned about uh, the rhetoric that has emerged from some corners uh, of uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, the loose talk of the use of any weapon of mass destruction, it is the height of irresponsibility. Russia, as a nuclear power, has uh, a solemn obligation uh, to act responsibly. Uh, Russia, as early as, as recently, I should say, as this year, again reaffirmed a maxim that's been around since the days of the Cold War uh, by underscoring what we heard from the UN Security Council, uh, that a nuclear war uh, must never be fought and cannot be won. Uh, that's something that uh, Russia affirmed, uh, has affirmed consistently uh, over the course of decades. It was affirmed after President Biden's summit uh, meeting with President Putin in June of last year, the UN Security Council uh, put it out uh, again this year. Now, we have seen contradictory statements. Uh, we have heard other uh, Russian officials downplay any potential use uh, of weapons of mass destruction. Regardless, it is, as I said before, uh, the height of irresponsibility for uh, anyone to engage in such loose talk, but especially coming uh, from a nuclear power uh, like Russia. It is dangerous not only in the context of Ukraine, uh, but it is also dangerous for the diluting effect uh, that such talk could have on the global nonproliferation norm. It is our goal, along with other responsible uh, nuclear powers and a broader set of stakeholders, uh, to see to it that the nonproliferation norm, uh, including uh, those norms that are enshrined uh, in the Nuclear Nonproliferation Proliferation Treaty, are instead uh, protected, uh, that they are fortified, uh, and that's why we're speaking out very clearly in response uh, to these uh, reckless comments uh, from, from the Russians. Yes, Francesco. Um, 
following up on Simon's questions on May 9, do you have anything to add on your assessment on whether Russia may or may not declare formally war and what that would mean for for Ukraine and for uh, the, its partners? And more broadly, what are your expectations or concerns on what may be said or happen on that day? Again, we are not going to uh, preview what the Russians uh, may seek to do uh, on the so-called Victory Day on, on May 9th. Yeah. Everywhere, we're, everywhere else, since, we're, you know, you since, since December, you've been Well, I, 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 I appreciate you acknowledging that now. Um, well, but, no, I'm uh, not saying that your previews were always correct, but I'm <laughs> saying, but, but you've been, you've made no, no, if, you haven't if, been shy. If we, if we have something specific to share, we will. What, what I can say is that uh, I think uh, everyone, including, uh, I assume, many of you in this room, uh, have good reason to believe that uh, the Russians will do everything they can uh, to use uh, the date uh, in terms of their propaganda effort. Uh, we've seen uh, the Russians really double down uh, on uh, their propaganda efforts, uh, probably, almost certainly, as a means to distract uh, from their tactical and strategic failures uh, on the battlefield in Ukraine, uh, the strategic failure uh, that we've seen this military campaign uh, uh, result in, in terms of uh, Russia's economy, its standing in the international uh, community, its position uh, on the world stage. And so I think it is safe to assume that uh, that will continue. I've seen the speculation uh, that Russia may uh, formally declare war. I suppose I would add that that would be a, a great irony uh, if uh, Moscow used the occasion of a victory day uh, to declare war, which in itself would uh, allow them to surge conscripts uh, in a way they're not able to do now, in a way that would uh, be tantamount to revealing to the world uh, that their war effort is failing, uh, that they are floundering uh, in their military campaign and military objectives. Uh, but I am quite confident that we'll be hearing more from Moscow in the lead up to May 9th. I'm quite confident uh, you'll be hearing more from the United States, uh, from our partners, including our NATO partners uh, in the lead up to May 9th as well. Uh, yes, Vivian. Um, despite the limited visibility that we have um, in Mariupol, especially at the steel plant, do you have any indication that Russia will allow more civilians to be evacuated? And also, is the U.S. working behind the scenes at all to facilitate some of those negotiations along with, I know the U.N. is taking the lead. Um, that's my first question. I have another one on Moldova. Well, we do welcome uh, the reports that have emerged uh, in recent hours that some civilians have been able to evacuate Mariupol. Uh, and we encourage continued efforts uh, to allow civilians to depart Mariupol and other cities under siege. Uh, we are in communication with, it, with the international humanitarian organizations involved in this effort. We will remain in close coordination and, and uh, communication with them. Uh, we will do that because we know that humanitarian corridors are absolutely critical to evacuating citizens and providing urgently needed humanitarian aid. That includes food, it includes medicine, it includes water. Uh, and, and other needed supplies, uh, needed by those who are besieged, who are uh, at this very moment uh, seeking to escape harm's way. People need to be let out. Humanitarian supplies need to be let in. Uh, we want to make sure that the limited humanitarian access we've seen in recent hours is not fleeting. Uh, doing so would demonstrate uh, that there may be a genuine humanitarian intent uh, behind this, this evacuation, uh, and not just another craven attempt on the part of the Kremlin to change the narrative, to achieve uh, a PR victory. Uh, we want this humanitarian access uh, to be sustained, uh, to be sustained until everyone who is trapped in Mariupol, everyone who is trapped uh, in other cities that are under siege because of this Russian assault, uh, is able to uh, flee to safety. Um, the second one on Moldova really quickly. You did address it about 10 days ago. The situation there hasn't quite stabilized yet. At what point is U.S. aid and also those renewed relations that we now, the engagements that we now have with the Moldovan go government at risk if the situation continues as is? Well, our relationship with the Moldovan government is not at risk. And I think, if anything, uh, you have seen us redouble uh, our partnership with uh, Kisinau in, in recent weeks. As you know, Secretary Blinken uh, was there just a few weeks ago. Uh, we had an excellent set of bilateral meetings uh, with uh, his counterpart as well as with the Moldovan leadership. Uh, we uh, 
restarted our strategic dialogue with Moldova uh, just uh, last month. It was the first time in several years uh, that we had held uh, a meeting of, our, of, of this strategic dialogue uh, precisely because uh, of the urgency of this moment, of uh, the imperative of demonstrating uh, our commitment to uh, the government, to the people uh, of Moldova, to its sovereignty, its independence, uh, its territorial integrity, and its constitutionally um, uh, enshrined neutrality as well. Over the course of our uh, relationship with Moldova, independent Moldova, the United States has uh, supported the Moldovan, Moldovan people uh, with hundreds of millions of dollars uh, worth of support. Uh, in recent uh, weeks alone, uh, we have provided uh, tens of millions of additional uh, dollars in humanitarian assistance. Moldova has opened its doors to those fleeing violence uh, across the border uh, in Ukraine. It has done so generously, and the United States will continue to stand by uh, the people and government of Moldova uh, as it does so. Said. Uh, anything else on Russia Ukraine? We'll just take a couple more questions, Jenny. Okay. Congressional delegation this weekend to Kyiv. Did any embassy officials or diplomatic security agents accompany this congressional delegation on that trip? Well, let me just say generally about the speaker's visit. Uh, it sends uh, a clear message that the United States stands uh, with Ukraine. It underscores underscores uh, the strong bipartisan commitment of the American people uh, to supporting the brave people of Ukraine uh, who are standing up to uh, the Kremlin's brutality. This delegation underscored uh, that we will continue to work with our allies and partners to maintain support for Ukraine and to do everything we can, uh, as I was saying before, to put pressure on Russia to strengthen Ukraine's position at the, on the battlefield uh, and to ensure uh, that Ukraine uh, emerges uh, victorious. We were in close coordination with uh, the Speaker and her office uh, in advance uh, of this visit. Of course, I'm not going to comment on security arrangements. Uh, but any time uh, the individual who is third in line to the presidency uh, travels uh, into uh, a place like uh, Ukraine, going into Kyiv, uh, of course, security uh, is of uh, uh, paramount importance to us. Yes. Uh, yes, one more. Yeah. Russia's uh, spy plane reported the violated um, air spaces of Denmark and Sweden over the weekend. Um, I wonder if you have any reaction given the fact that Denmark is a member of NATO. And one more question, there's another part of war going on, um, which is on the cyberspace. Uh, over the weekend, we heard the DDoS attacks uh, against Romania and Moldova. Uh, any uh, reaction from the state? So on the first, I would refer you to the Department of Defense. I'm, I'm aware there have been uh, a number of uh, routine uh, intercepts um, of, uh, of Russian aircraft, but the Department of Defense would be able to um, provide a, a, um, a more of a comment on that. Uh, I don't have anything specific to offer in terms of reported DDoS attacks uh, against our, our partners in Europe. We do know, however, that Moscow's uh, playbook is, is quite long. Uh, cyber attacks uh, are certainly uh, part of that playbook. We know that they have uh, used these tactics against countries in the region. We spoke openly uh, of cyber attacks uh, against Ukraine in the, in the hours uh, in the days leading up to uh, the start of the invasion, including uh, DDoS attacks uh, against Ukrainian uh, systems. So it's something we continue to watch uh, very closely. Uh, Said. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very quickly on the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Uh, last week, Matt asked you uh, about the new uh, Israeli rules on foreigners visiting West Bank, uh, which is was really quite an outrage and you know restricts Palestinians mainly, you know, schools, colleges, and so on. If you have any position on that. We're, we're aware of the new procedures for foreigners to enter uh, and reside in the West Bank uh, that were recently published by Israel's COGAT, uh, and they're due to go into effect, as we understand. Uh, we continue to study them. We are engaging with uh, Israeli counterparts to understand their applications uh, and, and any implications of them. But they go into effect on the 22nd of this month. So you're still studying them? Uh, we, we are still studying them, correct. That's the exact same answer I got. You were off, uh, uh, offline last week. So there, really there hasn't been, like since I think I asked on Wednesday, maybe yeah. Thursday. So really right, uh, there, hasn't, Tuesday, been, there right. hasn't been any yeah. more deep dive into what you, this actually means. You asked less than a week ago. Uh, they are due to go into effect. We are yeah. taking a close yeah. look at them. They're dated uh, and February. we will. We you will, guys have been aware of them for yeah. over a month. We will if we have some if, serious if, concern about this, as particularly as it relates to Israel's 
application or attempts to get into the visa waiver program. Right. Because when, it, when it comes, people who when it have actually when it comes, looked, when it, let me finish. People who have actually read it are concerned that this will give the Israelis a way to deny entry to Palestinian Americans before they actually present themselves in Israel. In other words, that they have to apply here to the to the embassy, and that the embassy can turn them down. And that under some kind of technicality, that the Israelis could then say they haven't actually been denied entry because they never actually got to Israel to present themselves in person. So that's the specific question. Now, please try to get an answer to what it is that you guys think about this. And, now, then, and I t on a tangential issue. Do you want me to speak to the visa waiver program? Well, or do yes. you want to go on with your soliloquy? Yeah, when it comes to the visa ahead, waiver you program, you go ahead when it comes to the visa waiver, waiver program, uh, we continue to work with our Israeli partners and with our Israeli counterparts uh, towards f fulfilling the program of requirements, including extending uh, reciprocal privileges to all U.S. citizens and nationals upon arrival. As you know, this is something that we work with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Secretary of State, along with his, uh, his Homeland Security counterpart, uh, will have authority over this, and we're continuing to work closely with our Israeli yeah, partners. That's on also it. the exact same answer I got last week, which was, you know, and more I, than five I, imag days I imagine that so will be the so answer until there's a, a well, potentially you know what? different if answer. Well, if I don't do a quote unquote soliloquy, I'm never going to get an answer to this question, at least not one on camera on the record. Anyway, tangentially to this issue, um, and Saeed has been asking about this, but these six human rights groups that were declared terrorist mm -hmm. organizations. So, two members, two senior members of two of these groups have been denied exit from Israel, one of whom is an American citizen, the other one has a, has a, a valid U.S. visa. Um, they were trying to get to Mexico for a meeting of the World Social Forum, which I imagine that you might be aware of, um, but they can't get out. Um, now, I know that you, don't, you probably won't have a lot to say about a U.S. visa holder because they're not an American citizen, but there is one American citizen, and I'm just wondering, like, the, this is Sahar Francis. Do you have anything to say about the Israeli? Uh, you're you're right, Matt. We we don't, as you know, visa records are confidential, so we're not in a position to comment on any uh, individual uh, individual visa holders. Uh, as we discussed with Saeed last week, we've made clear to our Israeli government and Palestinian Authority counterparts uh, that independent civil society organizations in the West Bank, in Israel, uh, must be able to continue their important work. Uh, we value the monitoring of human rights violations and abuses that uh, these uh, types of independent NGOs undertake uh, in places like Gaza, in the West Bank, in Israel, and elsewhere uh, around the world. And we strongly believe that respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms uh, and a strong civil society are critically important to responsive uh, and responsible governance uh, and democratic governance. And so that's why it's uh, important uh, that uh, uh, we continue uh, to monitor those conditions. Uh, and we absolutely will, uh, with the help of our okay. uh, partners and, uh, and on, the, on the actual, on the U.S. citizen, the U.S. passport holder, Ubay Abudi, the executive director of the Bison Center for Research and Development. Uh, again, Matt, as you know, we're not in a position to speak from the podium to uh, actions as it relates to well, a particular American citizen. Well, how about just citizen. denying, you know, American citizens the ability to leave? I mean, it's one thing to not allow them in. It's another to not let them leave, isn't it? Uh, Matt, I, I can't speak to a specific American citizen in this case. So I... Well, it's just to remind you that this uh, is actually, you know, uh, it's people like us, like myself, like my brothers and so on, uh, that go in and they are asked as they enter whether they own property, where they own that property, where they go and so on. This is some awful stuff. These are good, solid, tax-paying citizens of this country. I have another question for you on the King of Jordan. He is on a private visit to the United States. Will there be any meeting by the Secretary, with the Secretary of State on the issues that are ongoing, whether in the Locks and Mosque? Uh, typically, when world leaders travel here on, on private visits, uh, we don't speak to the schedule. Typically, uh, if it is a private visit, there won't be any interaction. I don't have any meetings to, uh, to preview. Yes, Michelle. Matt, uh, do you have any comment on the New York Times story on the death uh, of the Egyptian economist, Ayman uh, Hadwood? We are deeply disturbed by reports surrounding the death in custody of Egyptian researcher Ayman Hadoud uh, and allegations uh, of his torture while in detention. 
uh, the circumstances of his detention, his treatment, of his death, uh, we think require a thorough, transparent, uh, and credible investigation without delay. Uh, we have made clear, uh, with, including with our uh, Egyptian partners, that human rights uh, are a priority. Uh, we have urged the Egyptian government to make progress on protecting human rights uh, in virtually every session, whether it's over the phone, whether it's face to face. Uh, we have raised uh, the issue of human rights. We raise uh, the issue broadly. We also uh, raise specific cases. Uh, and uh, just as uh, we express our disturbance uh, when uh, there are significant and uh, shocking setbacks, uh, as in this case, uh, we also do uh, welcome when there are positive steps. Uh, and uh, we do welcome reports of Egypt's release last week uh, and over the weekend of dozens of political detainees and journalists. Uh, we strongly support uh, additional releases uh, and pardons, as we know, as we said before, uh, that uh, progress on human rights, uh, it will lead to progress in our bilateral relationship. Uh, that is true in the case of Egypt. Uh, it is true in every bilateral relationship we have. And uh, one more on uh, Iran. Reuters has uh, quoted Western officials saying that they have largely uh, lost hope that Iran nuclear deal can be resurrected. Uh, do you share the same assessment? It continues to be the case that we believe a mutual return to compliance with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, is in our national security interests. It is in our national security interests primarily uh, because it would reimpose uh, the permanent, the verifiable limits on Iran's nuclear program. It would put uh, a box back on Iran's nuclear program, uh, a program that has been uh, in many ways unshackled uh, since 2018, uh, and a program that has galloped forward in ways that are uh, unacceptable to us. They are unacceptable uh, to our partners uh, around the world. Uh, and it is something that uh, we seek to change. Uh, we will continue to uh, forge ahead with uh, efforts, with um, uh, dialogue via, uh, the, uh, via our partners, including the European Union, uh, to seek to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA for as long as we determine that a mutual return to compliance would be in our interests. Again, at this point, it would still be in our interests uh, if and when we reach the point uh, where the non-proliferation benefits of a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, would not overcome the progress that Iran has achieved uh, in its nuclear program in the past uh, three or so years. Uh, that's when we'll uh, reassess and uh, pursue an alternative course. Nick. Enrique Mora is offering to go to Tehran to break that deadlock, and Iran has not responded. Do you have any more detail you can provide on that? I would need to refer you to uh, Mr. Mora's office, but we are in, cl in close contact uh, with him, the EU coordinator. Uh, we, he does continue to convey messages back and forth. Uh, we do support his efforts to bring these negotiations uh, to a conclusion. Yes. Biden confirmed to CBS today that Austin Tice's parents are meeting with the mm -hmm. president. Um, does this signify any change or update in his case, or and or is it because Deborah Tice was recognized at the White House Correspondents' Dinner? And can you give us uh, an update on the assessment of his case? Uh, it's a testament to the fact that uh, the case of Austin Tice, uh, who has spent nearly a quarter of his life uh, in detention, he celebrated his 40th birthday, uh, this past year, this August, he will mark a solemn occasion of his uh, 10th anniversary uh, in custody. Uh, it is a testament to the fact that uh, achieving a successful resolution to this case, reuniting Austin uh, with his family, with his parents, Deborah and Mark, uh, that is a priority of ours. Uh, it has been a priority of ours. Uh, there is no higher priority uh, than uh, the safety and security uh, of American citizens who are detained around the world. Uh, and, of course, the case of, of Austin Tice uh, is one that has attracted, with good reason, uh, the focus, the attention uh, of the world. He is someone who uh, traveled the world, including into Syria, uh, to do nothing more uh, than to um, spread reporting, to spread the truth. Uh, and uh, he has been in detention. He has been away from his family uh, for far too long. We're doing everything we can uh, to see that come to a successful conclusion. Yeah. Will the Tices meet with Secretary Blinken or Roger Parsons or anyone at the State Department? And the State the Department is regularly in touch uh, with the Tices. Uh, we do have, uh, through our SPIHA office, 
uh, regular contact with them. Uh, the Secretary has had an occasion uh, to meet them, uh, including quite recently, uh, had an opportunity to uh, sit down uh, with, uh, with Deborah Tice. Can I just follow up on that? Yes. Uh, we know that the prisoner exchange that resulted in the freedom of Trevor Reed came after months of intense talks. Obviously, the diplomatic relationship with Syria is a bit different. Can the Tice family hope for a similar happy outcome, given mm -hmm. that circumstances? As we were, the point, uh, I made a couple points uh, in response to uh, the release of uh, Trevor Reed. Uh, one is that you didn't hear us uh, share the details uh, of those uh, consultations uh, before he was released. Uh, we do believe uh, that we can best and most effectively achieve potentially successful outcomes uh, if we do have space uh, to conduct private conversations. Uh, a second point, uh, we of course uh, don't have uh, I would say normal, uh, fully normal um, uh, relations uh, with Moscow at this time. And yet, uh, we were able to have a discrete, focused set of discussions regarding uh, the effort to free Trevor Reed that ultimately were successful. Uh, when it comes to our efforts to free Americans, uh, the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, Ambassador Carstens, uh, he will go anywhere, he will talk to anyone, uh, if it means that we're able to come home uh, with an American to reunite that American with her or his family. Uh, that is, uh, that uh, uh, is true in the case uh, of Austin Tice. It is true in the case of uh, Paul Whelan. It is true in the case uh, of the Americans who are uh, detained in Iran and Americans who are detained around the world. Yes. The U.S. government assessed that the Russian intelligence was behind the recent attack against Nobel uh, Peace Prize uh, laureate, actually winner, uh, Muratov. Uh, ahead of the press freedom day, I want to give you a chance to put that into context in terms of the state of press freedom in Russia. And secondly, uh, to South Caucasus, uh, there was a memorandum of uh, understanding uh, signed today between the U.S. and Armenia. Uh, uh, can you talk about the significance of nuclear cooperation uh, between the U.S. and the South Caucasus countries? And also, I've seen several MOUs between the U.S., Poland, and several other countries. What is the uh, process behind that, and uh, who approached whom? Uh, in terms the, of the, the process behind what? The uh, signature signing this memorandum of understanding. Got what it. is the process behind that? Uh, so uh, as you alluded to, there, uh, there was a bilateral meeting today uh, between the Secretary and his Armenian counterpart, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Mirzayan, uh, here at the Department of State. Uh, this will launch the U.S.-Armenia strategic dialogue. Uh, we will have uh, a readout uh, of this session later today. But what I can tell you now is that the Secretary committed to further strengthening bilateral relations uh, in line with our shared democratic values and continuing cooperation on Armenia's reform agenda. Uh, during the meeting, as you alluded to, the Secretary and uh, his foreign minister counterpart, they did sign a nuclear cooperation memorandum of understanding, uh, paving the way for increased cooperation on civil nuclear matters as Armenia looks to diversify its uh, energy supply. Uh, they also discussed Armenia's progress in implementing uh, democratic rule of law and anti-corruption reforms, uh, as well as uh, a broader dialogue uh, about relations between Armenia uh, and its neighbors. This will uh, lead into tomorrow's strategic dialogue. Uh, that strategic dialogue will coincide with the 30th anniversary of the establishment of U.S.-Armenian diplomatic relations. Uh, it underscores our shared commitment uh, to strengthening bilateral ties and uh, a bilateral relationship that is, uh, that is both broad uh, and deep, and that will be uh, broader and deeper uh, at the conclusion of this uh, strategic dialogue. When it comes to press freedom in Russia, uh, and you'll hear more from us uh, tomorrow, we're currently on the eve of World Press Freedom Day, uh, and so I do expect you will hear from uh, Secretary Blinken uh, tomorrow on World P Press Freedom Day, uh, but it is difficult uh, to identify uh, a, uh, a country uh, where we have seen uh, more setbacks, uh, more destruction uh, to the principle of press freedom and freedom of information uh, than in Russia over the past year, and especially in Russia uh, over the past few weeks, as the Kremlin has seemingly gone into overdrive uh, in its efforts to hide from its own people uh, the toll uh, of this war, the opposition uh, to this war, uh, the fact that this war is not going to uh, according to plan, uh, or at least not going to the plan uh, that the Kremlin put forward. Uh, we have seen 
uh, journalists thrown in jail. We have seen journalists intimidated. Uh, we have seen uh, news outlets in Russia be shut down. Uh, we have seen news outlets in Russia uh, be essentially forced uh, to close. And on top of that, we have seen the toll of Russia's assault on Ukraine, of course, principally in the first instance, uh, on the Ukrainian people. Uh, but journalists, reporters have also uh, paid the price. And just late last week, of course, we uh, lost a journalist with RFL, um, uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, who was killed uh, in a Russian strike on a residential apartment building uh, outside of Kyiv. Uh, she, of course, was the not, not the first journalist uh, to have lost her life uh, in this conflict. Uh, many more journalists have been injured. A journalist who should be uh, in this briefing room uh, right here today uh, was injured uh, as a result of, of Russia's aggression uh, as well. So this is something we'll be speaking to in more detail tomorrow, I can assure you. Uh, final final question? Uh, one more. Okay. All right. Let me go there, and then we'll come back. Bob Moore reaching out to Tehran. The Wall Street Journal report also says that Western diplomats have said that if Iran comes back with a demand uh, for a U.S. concession or another issue, Washington would be willing to consider it. Uh, sounds like there is a message here from Washington to Mora to take to Tehran if he goes. And is there any more room for concession to Iran? And what other possible issues within the framework of the JCPOA would Washington be um, willing to talk about? Uh, I, I think there was a, a, a slight misimpression, at least in the way it was conveyed. Uh, but what we have said uh, is that, one, we're not going to negotiate in public. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have made clear that uh, we are focused on the JCPOA, uh, on uh, the nuclear agreement. Uh, if Iran uh, wants to seek, um, uh, wants to put issues on the table that are outside uh, the confines of the JCPOA, Iran will, of course, have to be in a, in a position to make concessions uh, on those issues. That's just the very nature of any negotiation. Uh, but what we're focused on is the JCPOA, testing the proposition as to whether uh, we can achieve a mutual return to compliance. We'll continue down that path as long as we deem that uh, a potential return to compliance uh, would be in our interest. Uh, yes. I asked Jelena about this on Friday. Um, she said she was just learning of it in real time, which is fair enough, so she didn't have an answer. But, uh, this has to do with the situation in Nepal. It happened uh, on Friday. Uh, with the assault of uh, at least one, possibly two or three U.S. Embassy staff who were uh, trying to help a uh, father and daughter in a, a child abduction case. Um, what can you tell me about, uh, about that? Because I understand that the, the Embassy has filed a formal complaint with the Nepalese Home Ministry about this. Well, Jelena spoke on, on Friday to the child custody case. Uh, no, she said she was aware of it. I'm not actually well, asking about that right now. I'm asking about an assault on U.S. personnel. We've, we've been in touch with, uh, with our posts in Nepal. Uh, there's nothing that we can share publicly on, on any alleged assault. Uh, but when it comes to this uh, case, we're aware of reports of alleged child abduction in Nepal uh, involving U.S. citizens. We are providing uh, all appropriate consular assistance, as we do uh, in these cases. Our, our highest priority is the welfare of our citizens uh, overseas, and uh, we recognize that international child custody cases are, by their very nature, uh, complex. They're they're difficult, uh, but we're committed to doing all we can uh, to resolving these challenging cases. That, that's exactly what she said to me on Friday. Are you telling me that since Friday you guys haven't found anything else out? And why are you calling it an alleged assault? There's video of the, this assault that's out there on the internet. Matt, I'm I'm conveying to you what has been uh, conveyed to us from our team. Okay. Well, can I just make then? Can you uh, retry? Because uh, I'd like to find out, uh, especially if there were serious injuries to American personnel in this. Uh, and then, secondly, do you have anything to, uh, on the case itself? Um, what are you guys doing to help? Uh, Matt, you've asked. There was a court order again this morning in Chicago. The judge issued a restraining order. Um, on this, so uh, what, what what are you doing? You and, and, 
you, you've asked a number of questions today about what we're doing in the cases of specific Americans. Uh, we're obviously limited in what we can say in, the, in terms of the specifics, uh, especially from here. But uh, it is our- Because of why? Because of privacy considerations. Okay. So here's the Privacy Act waiver that they have signed. All right? And I'm happy to provide this to you, but I know that you, I know that you have it. So let's not go through this song and dance, okay? No, well, most of the time when I complain about this, I don't actually have the document, but now I do. So I would like to get a straight answer about what you guys are doing, and also, while, uh, and also find out what exactly happened to U.S. Embassy personnel who were assaulted, which is, you can see online. Uh, while they were attempting to assist in this case. Thank you. We uh, were in touch with the embassy today. Uh, it was conveyed to us that there's nothing additional we can share publicly at this time. If that changes, uh, <laughs> if, if, if. Does, this, does that mean that the Privacy Act, are, we, are you talking about the assault or are you talking about the I'm, case? I'm talking. Because if you're just going to say, because I have the Privacy Act waiver right here signed, and if you're going to say, well, that doesn't matter, well then, <laughs> then what does the Privacy Act wa waiver mean? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that. I was, I was referring to the, uh, to the alleged assaults. Right. Uh, Saeed, final question. Right, final question. Uh, can you clarify for us, Sahar Francis is not disallowed from entering the United States of America? Again. Is she allowed or not allowed visa, 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 the visa records are private and confidential. There's nothing I can say from here on the specifics of any particular visa record. Thank you all.